In past years, I've addressed the most pressing dietary issues of our time. Like, what's the healthiest variety of apple? <laughs> or what's the most nutritious nut? Or, or dried fruit? Or what's the best bean? What's the best berry? What's the best bowel movement? <laughs> right? We had fun. People got to vote. You know, some people, some folk came away all huffy. You know, especially the New Yorkers back there. Um, <clears throat> but this year, I thought I'd lighten it up and answer: What's the best way to prevent death? <laughs> Every year, the CDC updates the latest leading causes of death in the United States. So. Let's start at the top and go down the list, see what's new in each category. Heart disease, number one, the 35-year follow-up of the Harvard Nurses Health Study just published. Now, the most definitive long-term study on older women's health we have. Since the study started, thousands of participants died, but that allowed them to study the risk factors for mortality. Because heart disease was the leading cause of death, it comes to no surprise the dietary cholesterol intake right, was a significant risk factor for dying. Uh, the second leading cause was smoking-related cancer deaths. But what's so neat about this study is that it's a competing risks analysis. Right? So it allowed them to compare different risks to one another. So consuming the amount of cholesterol found in just a single egg a day appears to cut a woman's life short as much as smoking five cigarettes a day for 15 years. The most protective behavior they found was fiber consumption. Eating just a cup of oatmeal worth of fiber a day appears to extend a woman's life as much as four hours of jogging a week. Though you can do both, I don't, yeah. <laughs> it's, so it's worth noting that, look, the intake of cholesterol only found in animal foods was associated with living a shorter life, and the intake of fiber only found in plant foods associated with living a longer life. The one specific food most tied to longevity was nuts. You also appear to get four hours of weekly jogging benefit eating just two handfuls of nuts a week. All right. Yeah, heart disease, number one cause of death, but what if your cholesterol is normal? Right? Hear that all the time from patients. Right? Have to break it to them. Look, having a normal cholesterol in a society where it's normal to drop dead of a heart attack, not necessarily a good thing. And remember, number, it's our number one killer, right? In a huge study last year, most heart attack patients fell within the recommended targets for cholesterol, demonstrating that the current diet guidelines are just not low enough to cut heart attack risk. Close to half of, uh, close to half of heart attack victims had uh, cholesterol levels classified in the guidelines as optimal though I'm not sure their grieving spouses and orphan children will take much comfort in that fact. What is considered optimal is still way too high. Yeah, having a below average cholesterol you know, reduces your risk, but as the editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Cardiology wrote more than a decade ago, it's time to shift Right, from just decreasing risk to actually preventing and reversing, arresting atherosclerosis. We don't want low risk, we want no risk. How do you do it? Well, for the buildup of plaque in our arteries to cease, it appears that we have to get our total cholesterol down to be about 150, right? In other words, the cholesterol must be lowered to that of your average pure vegetarian. Now, but because relatively few people are willing to abide by the vegetarian lifestyle, you know, drugs are required you know, to get down to similar levels. Right? So it's our choice. Now notice though, even though the average vegan has a cholesterol of 150, it doesn't mean that all vegans have 150. That's why I do free cholesterol screenings here at Summerfest. Stop my table, a little drop of blood, just take a couple minutes. I'd be happy to do that for you. 
All right, so it's our choice, diet or drugs. Why not just choose the drugs, right? <laughs> well, no, it's a, that's a good question. Well, as the uh, good doctor um, noted last night, the FDA just announced newly mandated safety labeling by law to cholesterol-lowering statin drugs, right? So this is you know, Lipitor, Mevacor, Crestor, uh, Zocor, Vitor, and that kind of thing. The, is the FDA issued new side effect warning labels um, this year regarding the increased risks, um, brain-related risks, um, and associated memory loss and confusion, an increase in blood sugar levels, as well as new onset diabetes. One uh, prominent cardiologist described this kind of Faustian bargain, yes, fewer heart attacks, but more diabetes, right? With all the memory loss and confusion caused by these drugs, folks may have forgot there's actually a way to reduce the risk of heart attacks and diabetes at the same time. <laughs> Call the plant-based diet. All right, now uh, cholesterol is just half of the heart disease story. The other half is inflammation. Right? We've known for 15 years that a single meal high in animal fat, uh, sausage and egg McMuffin was used in the original study, can paralyze our arteries, right? cutting their ability to relax normally in half within hours of eating animal products. The whole lining of our vascular tree gets inflamed and stiffened. Right? And just as that inflammation, so here's ours, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Just as that inflammation, right? Just as that crippling of our arteries starts to finally calm down after five or six hours, lunchtime, <laughs> right? And then we may whack our arteries with another load of meat, eggs, or dairy, right? And so most people are in this chronic state of low-grade inflammation, increasing risk for these inflammation-related diseases like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, um, one meal at a time. Does the same thing to our lungs. Right? Again, within hours, inflammation in our airways. A single meal causing internal damage, not just years down the road, but literally right then and there, that day, within hours of it going into your mouth. And just this year, we finally figured out, we finally solved the mystery as to why. And it doesn't appear to be the animal fat itself. And it's apparently not the animal protein, which is what's implicated in, in the inflammation from arthritis. Right? So if it's not the animal fat and it's not the animal protein, uh, what is it? The whole thing is a crazy cool detective story that I'll be putting in a series of videos uh, next week actually, July 4th, July 5th, July 6th. Um, but uh, I'll just cut to the chase, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> after a meal of animal products, people suffer from endotoxemia. Their bloodstream becomes awash with bacterial toxins, known as endotoxins, that are present in the animal products. So, I mean, no wonder our body goes crazy. These dead meat bacteria toxins aren't destroyed by stomach acid, aren't destroyed by pancreatic enzymes, right? Aren't destroyed by cooking. They tried boiling meat for hours, still didn't work. And so um, these bacterial toxins were found to be highly resistant to cooking and our body's best attempts at acid and enzyme um, digestion. Now, the animal fat actually does play a profound role in this whole process by ferrying the bacterial toxins present in the meat through the gut into our system. So the reason animal products trigger immediate inflammation appears to be because they're so loaded with bacteria that can trigger inflammation dead or alive, even if they're fully cooked. And then saturated animal fat then boosts the absorption of these toxins into our bloodstream. So now that we know what's going on, what do we have to do? Well, from a 2012 follow-up, uh, well, the obvious, most obvious solution to this metabolic endotoxemia, okay, well, we can reduce saturated fat intake, which in this country is mostly uh, cheese and chicken, but the Western diet is not conducive to this mode of action, and it is difficult for patients to comply with this request. Right? So what, let's not even tell them, right? I mean, this patronizing attitude 
in the medical profession of, oh, patients won't change their diet or stop smoking. I mean, even if it's going to kill them, you know, so why bother, right? That attitude may be one of the real leading causes of death. But let's get back. But let's get back to the official list and take on cancer next. What's the latest? Well, we know from the largest forward-looking study on diet and cancer ever performed by humanity, the incidence of all cancers combined lower among vegetarians than meat eaters, um, especially some of the fastest growing tumors like lymphomas and uh, leukemias. And for that, the worst meat was actually poultry chicken up to triple the rates for every 50 grams of poultry consumption. A quarter of a chicken breast, triple your risk. Normally this whole presentation being the kind of quiz show format, but there was a scheduling mix up. I was supposed to be the last speaker at night, at night and so I could go long and not interfere with the schedule, but anyway, won't happen again. And so next year back to the quiz show format and apologize, I had to cut this short. Um, okay, but the link between meat and cancer is such that even the Journal of Meat Science last year asked, should we become vegetarians? <laughs> or they said, can we make meat safer? There's a bunch of additives, for example, you know, that can suppress the toxic effects of the blood-based iron, the, the heme iron found in meat. Now the, the additives are still under, uh, under study, but could provide an acceptable way to prevent colon cancer. Right? Because avoiding meat, obviously, completely out of the question. I mean, that's... <laughs> they fear that if the National Cancer Institute recommendations to reduce meat consumption were, observed, were adhered to, sure, cancer incidents may be reduced, but farmers in the meat industry would suffer important economic problems. Now, for those of us more concerned about the suffering caused by the meat industry rather than the suffering of the meat industry, <laughs> what happens if you put cancer on a vegan diet? Well, the Pritikin Research Foundation just completed this elegant series of experiments which I want to spend a bit of time on. Simple experiments. They put people on different diets, draw their blood, and then drip their blood on cancer cells growing in a petri dish and just stood back to see whose blood was better at suppressing cancer growth. They were the ones that published that study showing that the blood of those on a vegan diet was dramatically less hospitable to cancer. Now even the blood of those on a standard American diet fights cancer. I mean, if it didn't, everybody would be dead, right? Um, it's just that the blood of those eating vegan fights about eight times better. The blood of those on a standard American diet suppresses cancer growth by about 9%. You put people on a plant-based diet for a year, though, and their blood just tears it up. Right? The blood circulating through the bodies of vegans has nearly eight times the stopping power when it comes to cancer cell growth. Now this is for prostate cancer, most common uh, cancer among men. For women, it's breast cancer. So the Pritikin researchers tried duplicating this study with women using breast cancer cells instead. Now they didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results, so they figured they'd try to see what a plant-based diet could do in just two weeks against three different um, types of human breast cancer. This is the before, um, cancer growth rates powering away at 100%, and then this is after eating a plant-based diet for just 14 days. Now, slowing down cancer growth is, is great, but getting rid of them, getting rid of cancer cells is even better. This is before and after measuring cancer cell death, right? Um, this is the before and this is the after, pre and post plants. The same blood now coursing through these women's bodies gained the power to significantly slow down and stop breast cancer growth thanks to just two weeks of eating a plant-based diet. What kind of blood do we want in our body? 
What kind of immune system, right? Do we want blood that's just kind of going to kind of roll over when new cancer cells pop up? Right? Or do we want blood circulating to every nook and cranny within our bodies with the power to slow down and stop them? Now this strengthening of cancer defenses was after 14 days of a plant-based diet and exercise. They were out walking 30 to 60 minutes a day. Right? Wait, well, maybe the only reason their bodies became, you know, so effective at suppressing cancer cell growth was because of the exercise. Maybe diet didn't have anything to do with it. So they put it to the test. This is measuring cancer cell clearance. And this is what we saw before, the effect of blood taken from those eating a plant-based diet, in this case for 14 years, along with mild exercise, just like a walking every day, right? So, plant-based diets, Walking, that's the kind of cancer cell clearance you get. Now, compare that to the cancer stopping power of your average sedentary. You see this little burger, burger, apple? Oh, sorry, I can't. All right. <laughs> On the website, it's a little bit. Okay, but okay. Okay, compared to the cancer stopping power of your average sedentary meat eater, which is basically non existent. Okay. But. What about this middle group? Now this middle group, instead of 14 years on a plant-based diet, they had 14 years of the standard American diet, but had daily strenuous hour-long exercise, like boot camp this morning. Seriously, calisthenics, right? They wanted to know if you exercise hard enough and long enough, can you rival some, uh, some, some, uh, some uh, strolling vegans? All right. <laughs> Let's find out. <laughs> and exercise worked, no question, right? But literally 5,000 hours in the gym, no match for a plant-based diet. Here's an actual photomicrograph of uh, cancer cells stained so that they release light when they die, right? As you can see in the control group, there are a few cancer cells dying, right? Uh, even if you're a couch potato eating fried potatoes, uh, your body's not totally defenseless. But here's the hardcore strenuous exercise group, right? Cancer cells dying left and right, but nothing appears to kick cancer butt more than a plant-based diet. Why, though? Some people don't care, but I'm, I'm, I'm always curious. All right, how does a simple dietary change right, make one's bloodstream so inhospitable to cancer after just a few days? We didn't know until last year, when they sought to determine the underlying mechanisms for these anti-cancer effects. All right. And it is a wild story. I have a whole series of videos coming out about it. Um, the story involves little people and big people and big dogs and little dogs. Uh, it, involves, it involves marshmallows, tinker toys, cannibalism, and vegan bodybuilders. I from <laughs> beef steak to beef cake. I, it's, uh, I wish I had time, believe me. But uh, the videos will be up soon. Bottom line. The answer to the Pritikin puzzle is IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. Is the cancer-promoting growth hormone involved in every stage of cancer growth, spread, metastases, cancer invasion, but you put people on a plant-based diet and their IGF-1 levels, IGF-1 levels, plant-based diet go down, and if they continue to be on a plant-based diet, this is just after a few weeks, um, if you're on a plant-based diet low ter low, long term, um, levels drop even further. And their IGF-1 binding proteins go up. That's one of the ways our body suppresses cancer growth. Protect itself from cancer. Protect itself from excessive growth by releasing this binding protein into the bloodstream to bind up, to tie up IGF-1. It's like our body's, uh, you know, kind of emergency break. Yes, in as a little as 11 days, 
right? A plant-based diet can reprogram your body to bring down IGF-1 production, right? But what about all the IGF-1 that's circulating from the, you know, bacon and eggs you ate last week, right? So the liver releases this snatch squad of binding proteins to tie up, um, to, to take all this IGF-1 out of circulation, and as you can see, it just gets better um, with time the longer we eat healthy. Here's the experiment that nailed IGF-1 as the villain. All right, same as last time. Go on a plant-based diet, plant-based diet, and cancer cell growth rates drop dramatically. Right? And cancer cell death shoots up. Already saw that. But then, here's the kicker. Right? What if you added back to the cancer the exact same amount of IGF-1 banished from your body by eating a plant-based diet. Eating plant-based diet goes back. Let's take that same IGF-1, add it back to the cancer, and see what happens, and it erases the diet and exercise effect. It's as if you never started eating healthy at all. Right. So that's how we know that lowering animal product consumption leads to lower IGF-1, which leads to lower cancer growth. But how low does our animal product consumption have to go? How plant-based do our diets have to get? Well, let's look at the IGF-1 levels of meat eaters compared to vegetarians compared to vegans. Right? Does a plant-based diet, um, uh, is it better at uh, lowering uh, circulating levels of IGF-1 compared to a meat-eating diet or a lacto-ovo diet? And this is what they found. Right? Only the vegans, so meat eaters, vegetarians, vegans, only the vegans <laughs> had significantly lower levels. And the same relationship was found with IGF-1 binding protein levels, right? That's what we want higher. Again, we have got nothing here. Um, one really had to go to that final step, vegans, um, uh, to significantly bind up all that excess IGF-1 in their bloodstreams. Right? This was a study done uh, um, on women. What about, <laughs> what about vegan men? They found, they found the same thing. So even though vegan men tend to have significantly higher levels of testosterone, than both vegetarians and meat eaters, um, uh, which actually can, can promote the growth of prostate cancer. But the reason vegans, a vegan diet can actually reverse the progression of cancer, um, uh, which we've saw, I've shown you in previous years, um, the Dean Ornish work, um, uh, may be uh, because of how low their IGF-1 levels are. So high testosterone, but still low cancer in the vegans. The bottom line is that male or female, right? Just eating a vegetarian diet did not seem to cut it, right? Didn't do your body many favors, right? Looks like to get that significant drop in that cancer-promoting um, growth hormone levels, one really has to move towards eliminating animal products altogether. Now, the good news is, is that now, based on what we know about IGF-1, we can predict um, that a vegan diet uh, may be profoundly protective with respect to risk, for example, um, for breast cancer in older women. Okay, just 13 leading causes of death to go. Um, all right, let's run through the list here. The top three killers used to be heart disease, cancer, stroke. Oh, that is so 2011. <laughs> Now it's heart disease, cancer, and COPD, like emphysema, all right? Um, uh, so uh, thankfully, COPD can be prevented with a plant-based diet and even treated with plants, if you want to check that out. Now, of course, the, the tobacco industry took these landmark findings a little differently. Instead of adding plants to people's diets to prevent emphysema, wouldn't it be simpler to just Add them to cigarettes. <laughs> and voila, the addition of acai berries to cigarettes evidently has a protective effect against emphysema in smoking mice. <laughs> Next, they're going to start putting berries in meat, right? I couldn't make this up, people. Look at this. Adding fruit extracts to burgers, right? 
Now, this was not without its glitches. Uh, the blackberries literally dyed the burgers with this kind of distinct purplish color. <laughs> Though infusing lamb carcasses with kiwi fruit juice um, before rigor mortis set in does uh, evidently lead to greater tenderness in the meat. Um, and it is possible to improve the nutritional profile of frankfurters by adding ground up grape seeds. Um, uh, though there were complaints that the grape seed particles right, were visible in the final product. <laughs> and look, if there's one thing we know about hot dog eaters, it's that they're picky about what goes in their food. <laughs> right? Okay, but grape seeds? Ew. <laughs> Preventing strokes. Number four. Preventing strokes is all about eating potassium rich foods. Potassium from the words pot ash. You take any plant, put it in a pot, reduce it to ash, and what you're left with is potassium. True story. But can anyone name me a plant food particularly high in potassium? Why is that like the one thing everyone knows about nutrition? <laughs> Seriously, like did Chiquita have like this great PR firm or something? I, I bet you could walk into the Heart Attack Grill <laughs> where they're eating food like this, right? Ask anyone and they'd be like, I don't know, dude, but I do know bananas got potassium, right? <laughs> right? All right. In reality, bananas don't even make the top 50 sources. Coming in at number 86, right behind fast food vanilla milkshakes. And then bananas. All right. In uh, the top five sources are uh, tomato and orange concentrates. And in terms of the whole food sources, it is greens, beans, and dates. In fact, if you look at the next leading cause of death, right, bananas could be downright dangerous. <laughs> Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's now our sixth leading cause of death. We've known for 20 years now that those who eat meat, red or white, um, uh, including poultry and fish, were between two and three times more likely to become demented compared to vegetarians. And the longer that you're vegetarian, the lower your risk of developing dementia. But the exciting new research um, is actually on treating Alzheimer's using these natural plant remedies, which actually beat out placebo and uh, worked as well as the leading Alzheimer's drug. Um, again, uh, on the website, all for free. Um, next on the kick the bucket list is diabetes, which can be prevented with a plant-based diet and treated with a plant-based diet and even reversed in many cases of a plant-based diet. And I encourage everyone to check out Brenda's talk at 3 o'clock this afternoon. This is from October. Those eating vegetarian had, uh, had significantly lower rates than meat eaters, right? But it was the vegans that did the best. And this is the surprising thing. This was after controlling for obesity, right? Sure, vegans got lower diabetes rates, right? They're so skinny, right? But even at the same weight, vegans have just a fraction of the diabetes risk. Right? Why are vegans on average so slim? Well, obesity is so rare among those eating plant-based diets. Nutrition researchers have been desperate to try to uncover the secret. Yes, they eat fewer calories, right? but not that many fewer. In the past years, I've gone through a number of theories to try to explain this. Maybe it's because people eating plant-strong diets you know, express more of that fat-shoveling enzyme in the mitochondria, the power plants of our cells. I've talked about that. Maybe it's because the gut bacteria um, populations are different. Um, maybe it's because 
of avoiding the obesogenic chemicals, um, these endocrine disrupting chemicals in the meat supply. Uh, there's an obesity causing virus and poultry that may even be um, uh, playing a role. We're not sure. Theories keep coming. Here's the latest theory. Maybe it's to propionate. Right? After all, what's one of the one things that's only in plant foods? Fiber, right? Animals have bones to hold them up, plants have fiber to hold them up, right? Now we say, I thought fiber was defined as our inability to digest it, right? Well, true, we can't break down fiber, but the gazillions of good bacteria in our guts can. And what do they make with it? They make propionate, which gets absorbed into our bloodstream. So technically we can digest fiber, but just not without a little help from our little friends. So, but what does propionate do? Well, it inhibits cholesterol synthesis, that's good. It also appears to have what's called a hypophagic effect, uh, meaning it helps us eat less by apparently slowing the emptying of our stomachs, um, which makes us feel fuller, longer. Propionate um, regulates food intake, or whether it's because it slows the generation of uh, new fat cells, but it results in this overall anti-obesity effect. Um, uh, so, um, and we can actually boost the populations of these good bacteria in our guts without taking probiotics, just by eating vegetarian, right, because we're feeding our little friends with fiber. Animal foods also tend to be kind of calorically dense. For example, to walk off the calories found in a single pat of butter, you'd have to walk, add an extra 700 yards to your evening stroll that day. Right? Or a quarter mile jog to each sardine we put in our mouth. Right? And that's just the edible part. And any who choose to eat two chicken legs better get out on their own two legs and go run an extra three miles that day to outrun weight gain. And that's for steamed chicken, skin removed. Here's the latest. Meat consumption and prospective weight gain. Right? We're talking hundreds of thousands of men and women studied across 10 countries with weight gain measured over a five-year period. What did they find? Total meat consumption associated with weight gain um, in men and women. The conclusion is that uh, the, uh, um, the de decrease in meat consumption may improve weight management. And this was after for controlling for initial weight and physical activity, education level, smoking status, total energy intake. What? That's the kicker. This was after controlling for calories. Right? The link between meat and weight gain remained even after controlling for calories, meaning you have two people eating the same number of calories, the one eating more meat may gain more weight. They even calculated how much more. Intake of 250 grams of meat a day, which is nothing for, uh, compared to what uh, the U.S. Um, eats, will lead to an annual weight gain of 422 grams higher than the weight gain experience with the same calorie diet with lower meat content. Right? After five years, the uh, weight gain would be about five pounds more. So same calories, yet five pounds heavier eating meat. And steak was nothing. The strongest relationship between annual weight gain was observed for poultry. Right? Let's say uh, you start out at normal weight, eat a hamburger every day. Right? Well, this is how much extra weight you'd gain in addition to the calories that are present. Um, what, and if you ate the same number of calories instead of processed meat, like a ham sandwich with three slices of deli meat, you'd be up to here. And then half a chicken breast um, puts you up to here, again, above and beyond the calories. Right? In conclusion, our results indicate that meat intake positively associated with weight gain. This persisted after adjusting for energy intake and therefore um, we're in favor of this public health recommendation to decrease meat consumption for health improvement. Right. Uh, for more, make sure to check out the meat industry's take on this study, very interesting, um, as well as PCRM's uh, wonderful work trying to put a vegan diet um, to work in a corporate setting. Kidney failure. Eighth leading cause of death can be prevented with a plant-based diet, can be treated with a plant-based diet. Why? Because our kidneys are highly vascular organs, right? That's why kidneys look so red inside. Right? Our two little kidneys filter through our entire bloodstream. And so, if the standard American diet is so toxic 
to blood vessels in our heart, brain, and pelvis, leading to heart attack, stroke, sexual dysfunction. What might it be doing to our kidneys? Long story short, Harvard researchers found three significant risk factors for declining kidney function, meaning losing, you start to lose protein out of your urine. Your body's not supposed to be peeing out its protein. The three risk factors for declining kidney function were animal protein, animal fat, and cholesterol. It's not protein, it's not fat. Animal protein, animal fat. No relationship found with plant protein and plant fat. Not only do vegans appear to have better kidney function, but dramatic improvements were found treating kidney failure patients with pure vegetarian diets after just one week. Right. Leading killer number nine is people dying from respiratory infections. Um, so uh, check out my, um, my video, Kale and the Immune System, talking about the immunostimulatory effects of kale. Is there anything kale can't do? <laughs> And if you uh, look at my uh, video, Boosting Immunity Through Diet, which is actually, if you can see this, June 28th, this is just the video uh, of the day that went up on Wednesday, um, you can see that um, eating just a few extra fruits and vegetables can significantly improve one's immune response to pneumococcal pneumonia. Suicide is number 10. Now, last year at Summerfest, I talked about improving mood through diet. We know vegetarian diets were, have been associated with healthier mood states, but you don't know if it's cause and effect until you put it to the test. And that's what was done this year. You take regular meat eaters and you remove meat, fish, poultry, and eggs in this study from their diets. And you can see a significant improvement in mood scores after just two weeks. I mean, it can take drugs like Prozac you know, months to take effect. In fact, the way drugs like Prozac work is they boost the levels of the so-called happiness hormone serotonin. Did you know that there, was, there is serotonin in plants? I had no idea. I certainly didn't. But there's serotonin and dopamine and all sorts of human neurotransmitters in plants. So much so, there's been a call to start treating depression with high content sources of serotonin. You know, like plantains, pineapples, bananas, kiwis, plums, and tomatoes, right? And what's the down, I mean, what's, what's the side effects? You got a little seed stuck in your teeth or something, right? <laughs> Maybe that's why high intake of fruits, vegetables, mushrooms, and soy associated with decreased prevalence of depression. Right? Maybe that's why improved behavior in teenagers was significantly associated with higher intakes of leafy green vegetables and fresh fruit. Right? Uh, for more, uh, keep an eye out for my videos on the wrong way to boost serotonin, which is by these uh, tryptophan supplements, a better way um, to raise serotonin to fight uh, things like premenstrual depression, um, and, uh, and then the best way, um, as reported in this double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover study on the successful use of butternut squash seeds in the treatment of social anxiety disorder, for example. Amazing. How might a plant-based diet prevent systemic infections? Well, meat-borne bacteria can directly invade one's bloodstream through the intestinal wall or in women can creep up into their bladder. Just this month, June 2012, we have direct DNA fingerprinting proof, finally, right, that women eating meat are getting urinary tract infections from eating meat contaminated with fecal bacteria that then crawl up into their bladder. And chickens are the most likely reservoir. Wait a second, you can't sell unsafe cars, you can't sell unsafe toys. How is it legal to sell unsafe meat? Well, they do it by blaming the consumer. As one USDA poultry microbiologist said, meats, raw meats are not idiot proof. They can be mishandled and when they are, it's like handling a hand grenade. You pull the pin, someone's going to get hurt. <laughs> See, if we get sick, it's our fault. Right? Now, so while some may question the wisdom of selling hand grenades in supermarkets, <clears throat> 
The USDA poultry expert disagrees. Says, I think the consumer has the most responsibility, but just refuses to accept it. Right? It's like a car company saying, yeah, we installed faulty brakes, but it's your fault for not putting your kid in a seatbelt. Right? A director at the Centers for Disease Control responded famously to this kind of blame the victim attitude from the meat industry. Is it reasonable, she asked, if a consumer undercooks a hamburger that their three-year-old dies? Is that reasonable? Not to worry though, the meat industry's on it. All right, they just got FDA approval for a bacteria-eating virus to spray on the meat. <laughs> now, some have raised concerns about these so-called uh, bacteriophages, um, such as the possibility that these viruses can spread toxin genes between bacteria, which wouldn't go good, especially given the difficulties um, in preventing large numbers of these viruses from being released into the environment from the slaughterhouses. All right. Now, it could also allow the meat industry to become more complacent about food safety, right? If they know they can just kind of spray some viruses on at the end, right? Similar to the quick fix argument about irradiation. From the industry point of view, right, who cares if there's fecal matter in the meat as long as you can just blast it at the end with enough radiation, right? Now, the meat industry's concern that consumer acceptance of these bacteria-eating viruses may present somewhat of a challenge to the food industry. Uh, not that they'd ever be labeled, of course. Um, but if they think that's going to be a challenge, check out their other bright idea. <laughs> the effects of extracted housefly pupae on chilled pork preservation. This is a sciencey way of saying they want to smear a maggot mixture on the meat. Now, it's a low cost, simple method, think about it. <laughs> Maggots thrive on rotting meat, yet there have been no reports of maggots having any serious diseases. Not that anyone's really checked, but I mean, right? indicating that they have a strong immune system, right? They must be packed with some kind of antibacterial properties, otherwise they, they die themselves eating rotting meat. All right. So, they took maggots that were three days old, washed them, dried them, kind of toweled them off, put them in a tissue blender, kind of a little Vitamix action there, and then, voila, safe for meat! We did kidney failure, what about Liver failure. We've known for 35 years, since now you can't even see this, 1977, that a vegetable protein diet can be used to treat liver failure, significantly reducing the toxins that otherwise would build up eating meat with a less than functional liver, right? Imagine eating meat without, you know, uh, without a fully functioning liver to detoxify your blood. Right? I do have to admit, though, that some people living on plant-based diets have worsening liver function. They're called alcoholics. <laughs> In fact, strictly plant-based, right? Uh, living on potatoes and corn and barley and, and grapes. Uh, yeah, still, however, not doing so hot. It's, uh, it's unclear. <laughs> High blood pressure is up next, so-called essential hypertension, essentially only found in those who eat meat. Again, look at this. We've known for decades, it's 1974 out of Hopkins, right? We've known that consumption of foods of animal origin highly significantly associate with blood pressure even after, again, the weight effects are removed, right? Fast forward 39 years to 2012 and compared to non-vegetarians, compared to meat eaters, as you get more and more plant-based, right? So, so meat eater to flexitarian, to just eating fish, to lacto -over vegetarian to vegan, looks what happens to hypertension, high blood pressure, right? There is this progressive reduction in risk to just a tiny fraction. See the same thing in diabetes. Here's diabetes, right? Again, the stepwise reduction of risk as one eliminates animal products um, on down. Right? And, uh, oh, and same thing with body mass index, right? Um, uh, as you can see, 
um, obesity rates get lower and lower. In fact, vegans are actually the only population on average that was not overweight. Even the vegetarians were overweight. All right. Diabetes, hypertension, leading causes of death. Is it going to take the medical profession another 39 years before we actually do something about it? How long does it take, being vegan, to bring blood pressures down? 12 days, right? McDougal took 500 meat eaters, put them on a vegan diet over a span of 11 days. Uh, dropped their blood pressure 6%, about double that drop in those that were hypertensive to begin with. 